everyone. Welcome to AIH Connected, our online patient conference. My name is Erin Anderson, and I'm the Director of Programs and Advancement for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association. The AIHA has been getting more and more questions about diet from our members. As we have shared before, unfortunately, there are no studies about diet in autoimmune hepatitis. So we're unable to provide any recommendations about what specific diets can potentially help patients autoimmune hepatitis. It's a really big gap and a need and a topic that we as an organization would love to help promote research in. While we don't have any studies in AIH, there are studies about diet in other autoimmune diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease. As a first step to eventually conducting a diet study, we thought it would be helpful to learn what diets have helped other diseases. That's where today's conference talks come in. Before I introduce our first speaker, a quick disclaimer. This presentation is not intended to provide medical advice. Only your own doctor should determine your course of treatment. You should also check with your own doctors before starting any new diets, medications, or supplements. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. James Lewis from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Lewis is a clinical researcher who has spent more than 20 years studying inflammatory bowel diseases, medication safety, and optimizing medical therapies. His most recent research has been dedicated to the impact of diet on the gut microbiome and the course of inflammatory bowel disease. Welcome, Dr. Lewis. Thank you again for welcoming me. Uh, it's nice to speak to a new audience with common interests. Uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest. Probably the only ones that are particularly relevant to today are my relationships with uh, Nestle Health Science. We all love to eat. Uh, there's lots of different ways to find what restaurant you want to eat at. I certainly can say from my family, uh, one of the things that we've missed the most in the pandemic is being able to go out to restaurants, but hopefully we're getting, uh, getting close to the end of that. Um, the main challenges with food, uh, you can think of in these four gigantic bins of some people eating too little, some eating too much, some people eating at the wrong time, and certainly what we usually think about in terms of uh, chronic disease management with, with nutrition is whether we're eating the wrong stuff. And you know we'll spend most of the time dealing with that fourth one today. Uh, this is not to uh, endorse or say there's anything wrong with any of these restaurants, but just to highlight the fact that most of us don't really worry that much about what we're going, what we're eating until we have a problem. And then we start thinking, hmm, I wonder if what I'm eating is in any way contributing to, to this health problem. In fact, what we are eating in America is a lot of fast food. Uh, these are some data that were collected by the National Center for Health Statistics that noted that about a third of U.S. adults consume fast food on any given day, um, meaning, uh, you know, if you had 100 people, about 37 of them uh, stopped at whatever your favorite local fast food uh, place is to pick up some food. Um, and you've probably followed the story that uh, there's a lot in the news about processed foods, um, so I thought I would spend a minute or two helping you to think about what processed foods really are. These are foods that have undergone biological, chemical, or physical processes to improve their texture, taste, or shelf life. Uh, this does not necessarily mean that processed foods are bad for you, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, most processed foods have a higher content of fat and added sugar and salt. That's why they taste so good. Um, they tend to not have a whole lot of fiber or vitamins. Um, and then there's the real category that people are most interested in are these ultra processed foods. Um, these are things that don't look like where they came from. So think about a potato chip doesn't look like a potato. A hot dog, whether it's pork or beef, does not look like pork or beef. Chicken nuggets, for the most part, don't look like chicken. I think cereal is one of the, the great examples. Cereal does not look like the grains that it came from. Um, turns out that in the U.S. and Canada, we get about 25 to 50% of our calories every day from ultra-processed foods. And this is a little bit where some of the questions of, of the health and safety come in. Um, and so if you look at where do we get those 25 to 50% calories coming from ultra-processed foods, 
uh, a big chunk of it come from sugary products and, and drinks, particularly things like soda um, and then starchy foods and, and breakfast cereals. Everything else is, is makes up a much smaller proportion of that ultra processed foods that, that we think about. But some things that you might think of as being like, oh, I should be eating that are still ultra processed foods. So chicken breast that is not like chicken breast that you just cut off the chicken and cook, but like that you get sliced at the deli, that's, that's a processed meat. Um, certainly pastrami, you know, ham, et cetera, all of those are, are processed meats. Um, why does this matter? Well, it might matter because uh, it doesn't necessarily necessarily related to autoimmune hepatitis or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, but here are some data that would suggest that um, the more ultra processed foods people eat, the higher their risk of developing cancer is. So if you take nothing else from this discussion today, maybe a diet that's low in ultra processed foods would reduce your risk of getting cancer. Uh, in addition, uh, the percent of calories that people get from all ultra processed foods uh, seems to be related to your risk of cardiovascular disease. Don't worry about the details of this complicated figure, but it basically suggests is that people's um, risk, if you compute their risk for future cardiovascular disease, it tends to be inversely related with how much of their calories they get from ultra processed foods. So another reason to think about avoiding them. Uh, why, why might they be bad? Um, well, one, I already mentioned, they have lots of salt and sugar and saturated fats. Uh, they're also super palatable, meaning when you eat them, you love the taste and they have a lot of calories. And so it doesn't, that wonderful taste doesn't necessarily turn off your desire to keep eating. Um, in addition, if you're eating ultra processed foods, like we only take in so many calories a day. So you might be cutting out foods like fresh fruits and vegetables that have other health benefits. Uh, and then there's a theoretical risk of eating packaged foods and whether or not there are small chemicals or molecules that come off of the packaging that you're exposed to that may have negative effects. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot of interest and in some work that we've been working on are whether some of these chemical additives might change the microbes that are living in you, particularly in your intestines and the small molecules that those microbes produce. And on the right, I'm just highlighting the fact that, you know, we think about individual foods, but, but food is very complicated. Um, not only the foods composed of nutrients, but there's also contaminants in food. There's the additives that we were just talking about. And even the way you cook foods might influence what, what certain chemicals or molecules are in there. There's a number of these sort of chemical products of cooking. Um, so if you're not going to eat a lot of ultra processed foods, what should you be eating? Uh, and I would say this is the second take home point. Again, not specific to autoimmune hepatitis, but there's a little downside to eating what we would consider a Mediterranean diet. Uh, this is a diet that uses oil as the main source of fat, has lots of consumption, and I shouldn't say any oil, olive oil, um, has high consumption of fruits and vegetables and legumes and complex carbohydrates, moderate consumption of fish, and small amounts of uh, red wine with meals. And you can see absence on this are things like red meat and lots of dairy. Um, uh, those are not really part of a Mediterranean diet. And why would this make sense? Well, we've talked already about risk of cancer and the risk of heart disease, but if you just look at overall survival, um, if this is a figure that pulls together a lot of different studies that showed that the more one followed a Mediterranean style diet, the less likely they were to die. So you essentially lived longer if you were following this diet. And part of that is certainly related to reduced incidence of cardiovascular disease and perhaps cancer. So take home point number one, if you're going to the grocery store, shop the outside aisle of the grocery store. That's where you're gonna find your fresh fruits and vegetables, your fresh meats and fish, 
try and use olive oil as the main fat that you use in your diet. Um, and if you're looking for a snack food, think about mixed nuts as an alternative to chips, cookies, and other things like that. All right, that's just diet in general. I'm gonna spend a bit of time now telling you about inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's disease. So these are, um, inflammatory bowel disease includes two main diseases, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are chronic inflammatory disorders of the intestines. And for the sake of this talk, you don't really need to really focus on the difference between the two. Just know that they, they cause inflammation in the intestines. People get periods of, of diarrhea, bleeding, abdominal pain, and as you can see on the right, some, some other manifestations that aren't in the intestines, skin changes, eye changes, mouth changes, um, and a whole host of, of other things that can happen to them. This disease is thought to be a consequence of an overly robust immune system response to, um, to the environment, particularly to the microbes that are living in our intestines. Uh, but possibly to other other factors. And um, I, I've really told you about most of these things, so I'm gonna skip over this for the sake of time uh, and jump to why do we why do we care about diet in for patients with Crohn's disease? And it is that even our best therapies aren't effective in all our patients. Our patients want to know what they should be eating. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that immune mediated diseases like Crohn's disease, like ulcerative colitis, like, like autoimmune hepatitis are rising in society at rates that are way too fast to be explained by genetics. So if it's not genetics, there's gotta be some environmental factor that's influencing this. Um, and science tells us that that environmental factor, at least for Crohn's disease, is something that's in our intestines. And uh, the way I'm going to try and convince you of that is to explain that Crohn's disease most commonly involves the end of the small intestines and the very beginning of the colon. And one of the treatments for that is surgery to remove the diseased part of the bowel, but it does not cure Crohn's disease. Almost 100% of people will eventually have recurrence, and that recurrence typically happens right where the bowel is sewn back together. When the surgeon does the operation, there are two different ways that they can do this. They could just sew the bowel back together um, and close the person up, or they can create what's called an ostomy. They can bring up a loop of intestines to the skin so that, um, and they do this above where they've sewn the bowel together so that almost all of the intestinal content is coming out into a bag that they're wearing on their abdomen. Um, and it's protecting that area where it's sewn back together. And it turns out, again, don't focus on the nitty gritties of the images, but it turns out that, that the recurrence of the disease doesn't happen until after you take down that ostomy. And so now the intestinal contents are going past where the bowel is sewn back together. And this was actually demonstrated by a friend of mine almost two decades ago, more than two decades ago, when he took three of these people, did a colonoscopy, so put a camera in through their bottom and went up to the where they're sewn together, showed that it was all healed while they had their ostomy, then took the, the contents that were coming out of this ostomy into the bag, put it in a syringe, and were able to squirt it into the, the other part of the bowel so that where they were sewn together was exposed, repeated the colonoscopy a week later, and all three people had inflammation. That doesn't prove that it was the food that we were eating, but there was something in the luminal content, in the, in the contents of the bowel that seemed like it's probably driving that inflammation. And there's lots of things in there. There's the microbes that live there, there's digestive juices, but some part of that content contributed to that. And that was one of the things that really got me sort of interested in thinking, well, food is one that we can really change easily. Maybe that's the culprit. Um, just a, a brief comment about uh, additives and, and emulsifiers. I've, I mentioned these are part of these ultra processed foods. Um, and you can think of these as molecules that, that make 
liquids stay together. So if you think about mayonnaise, the reason mayonnaise doesn't separate out the oil from the other parts is that there's emulsifiers in there that, that holds it together. These are, can also be thought of as thickeners. Um, and there's some basic science that says, hmm, some of these emulsifiers may thin the layer of mucus that protects our intestines and lets the, these microorganisms get closer there. And I told you before that at least for Crohn's disease, one of the theories is there's this just overly robust immune system attack on these microbes. And so if you have these emulsifiers and it thins this mucus layer, it may let the microbes get close enough to the lining of the intestines that it triggers the immune system to go crazy. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, a friend of mine uh, in, in Georgia uh, has shown that putting these uh, emulsifiers, which are in lots of our foods that we eat, into the drinking water of mice results in thinning of that mucus layer, uh, which is the green on this, these slides and allows the, uh, the bacteria, which are these like little reddish orange dots to get closer to the lining of the intestines, which is this purple, uh, purple and blue layer right here. Uh, and in fact, if you give these to mice that are predisposed to getting intestinal inflammation, they actually are, they are even more likely to develop intestinal inflammation. If you put, there's two emulsifiers that he studied, CMC and polysorbate 80. If you put either of them in the drinking water of the mice that are predisposed to this genetically, they're even more likely to get sick. Um, suggesting that these are, a, even though they're commonly consumed in our food, that maybe in the in people who are predisposed, maybe there's uh, a potential harm. Actually, at least in mice that are predisposed, there's harm. Maybe this translates to humans. Um, so, with that as as background, um, how could we change our diet to try and make these diseases better? And there's three global strategies that you can think about. One is we could take an additive or a supplement. One is we could take food out of our diet, but remember we have to replace it either with more of the same food or with something else because we still have to get sufficient calories in. Or lastly, we could completely modify our food and give it intravenously or as like a nutritional supplement. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these last two approaches um, because they've been studied fairly widely in Crohn's disease. Um, so, the, this idea of an enteral formula, think of these as meal replacement liquid formulas. You see these advertised on TV, Ensure, Boost, Modulin, there's a number of them on the market. And people can take them just as a caloric supplement, or we can use what we've defined, what we call partial enteral nutrition, where you try and get about half your calories from the formula, or exclusive enteral nutrition, where people, we have them get almost 90% of their daily calories, actually more than that, from from the formula. So they're consuming almost nothing else than formula. Um, and it turns out if you do this for people with Crohn's disease, particularly in children, uh, it is highly effective. And it doesn't really matter which formula you use. On the left shows that the formula didn't really matter. But in the, this middle of the slide, you can see that uh, for uh, children with Crohn's disease, about 70% of them went into complete remission drinking this formula with no other medications required. Like that, if that was a medication, that would be a wonder drug because certainly it's a lot better than you see with placebo at, uh, in drug trials at the same time. Now you can't really do a placebo trial of food very easily um, because people can tell what they're eating. Uh, but the point here is um, this is sort of proof of concept, at least in Crohn's disease, that nutrition can have a therapeutic benefit. The problem is, as I said at the beginning, we all love to eat. So why would we, like, nobody wants to live on this formula for the rest of their life. Eating is, and I don't think they should, like eating is an important part of our existence from not just a, a um, not just getting calories and nutrients into us, but it's part of our mental health as well. Um, so if we, if we can't do that forever, what, what could we do in terms of 
of trying to modify our diet. Well, well, people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, both of these inflammatory bowel disease, they try to change their diet all the time. This was a survey we did of a couple thousand patients where we just asked them, what do you eat because you think it makes your symptoms better? And what do you avoid because you think it makes your symptoms worse? And consistently, people were more likely to say that yogurt and rice made their symptoms better or were more likely to make their symptoms better than worse. Um, in contrast, there were lots of other foods where people were more likely to say it made their symptoms worse than good. And some of these are sort of the usual culprits that you might think about, spicy foods, fried foods, um, milk, red meat, soda, popcorn. Um, Again, this is, this is sort of anecdote, but quantified anecdotes from a couple thousand patients. And it gives a hint of maybe things that like yogurt and rice might, might be a good way to improve people's symptoms. Um, there have been a, a number of randomized clinical trials done um, to test different diets for people with Crohn's disease, whole food diets. The problem is most of them haven't been really great studies. And this often happens in the very beginning of trying to do some, some diet research in these sorts of diseases. This, these data were summarized in, by a group called the Cochrane Collaboration. And I, I just highlight for you with a couple blue arrows here, most of these studies were really small, not very many patients in them. And if you critically analyze these studies, they were all graded as very low quality evidence. Um, and for the most part, they didn't show any significant benefit uh, regardless of what the different, different diets were. Um, there was one early study of low microparticle diet that looked particularly favorable, but the repeat study really, really didn't support that. Um, there's been a few studies that took people who were feeling well and asked were they, if they changed their diet, would they be more likely to stay well? Um, these looked at things like reducing the refined carbohydrates, um, a low red or processed meat diet, uh, various exclusion, an exclusion diet and a symptom guided diet. Um, the good news is the grade of these studies wasn't for the most part very low. Most of them made it to low and I take uh, personal pride in that since uh, this one about low red and processed meat was, was done by uh, myself and my colleagues. The downside of it was we didn't find any evidence that this was beneficial. Um, I'm not going to try and teach you statistics today, but when the result of this analysis comes out to whoops to equal 1.0, that means it wasn't any bad, any benefit at all. 1.03 is about as close to 1.0 as you as you can get. So uh, I what I took from that study is if patients really like red meat, I tell them it may not be great for your heart. It's not part of a Mediterranean diet, but I don't think it's bad for your Crohn's disease. Um, but I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some other studies that uh, have happened recently um, that have been larger and hopefully the world will think of as, as higher quality studies. This is one that I uh, just ran uh, that we refer to as DYNE-CD. Um, so this was a study in Crohn's disease again. And it was a unique study because patients told us they wanted to see this study. They wanted to know about a diet that's referred to as a specific carbohydrate diet and whether it was effective for people with Crohn's disease. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about clinical trials before I show you the results of this to help you understand the results. So a clinical trial is an intervention that's not part of universal care. So this would not necessarily have been these people's diets were they not in this study. Um, a controlled clinical trial means there's two interventions that were compared to each other, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. And a randomized controlled clinical trial means that the, the chance determined which intervention, or in this case, which diet a participant receives. They didn't get to choose. They were randomly assigned to one or the other. And the reason that randomized controlled trials are so important is that in a large trial, the, the um, different intervention groups will usually wind up looking very similar if randomization works. The idea is if you randomly pick who gets what, they're, at the end, the two groups look the same. So when that's the case, any differences that you see in outcomes, you can attribute to the effect of the intervention as opposed to selectively who was getting one diet versus the other. 
And I told you I wasn't going to teach you a lot of statistics, but I want to tell you just a couple things. So statistical tests determine uh, how likely we would see the findings based on chance. Um, so if I said that a, that um, there's a p-value of, of 0.8, it means there's an 80% likelihood that we could have seen a difference that big by chance alone. Um, sometimes we do statistical comparisons between groups. Um, and I think those are the ones that you really wanna focus on because they're looking at what maybe was causal um, by the intervention. And sometimes we look at within group tests. I think those are interesting, but they're not necessarily due to the intervention. They may have just been what we refer to as regression to the mean, like just the way the disease fluctuates over time. They raise hypotheses, but they're not, um, they're not as important as the between group tests. And just um, traditionally, we say if this p-value is less than 0.05, that that's quote statistical significant, um, meaning that the findings are unlikely to be due to chance, but not impossible. Um, and more than 0.05, we say it's not statistically significant, but it doesn't mean that things are equivalent. So with that little background, I'm gonna tell you about this trial that we just did. This, is, um, this trial uh, compared the specific carbohydrate diet, which was made famous uh, by Elaine Gottschall. It was initially used to treat celiac disease before we knew what celiac disease was. Um, but Elaine Gottschall wrote this book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle, talking about use of this um, for a number of, of different uh, conditions, but particularly Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> and her theory was that, that these carbohydrates that we consume lead to growth of the bacteria in our intestines, and then they make small molecules um, that by fermenting the carbohydrates and that that injures the intestines and this whole vicious cycle um, circles around on itself. I'm not gonna tell you that that's true or false. I'm just telling you that was, that was her theory. Um, and we compared this to the Mediterranean diet, which I told you about before, because A, it reduces all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease and cancer, and B, in people with Crohn's disease, there's some suggestion that following that diet made you less likely to go on to develop Crohn's disease, and maybe it reduced symptoms and improved quality of life. Um, and so I've told you about the Mediterranean diet before. Let me just tell you about this specific carbohydrate diet. Um, this is characterized by a high intake of unprocessed meats, poultry, fish, shellfish, and eggs. Uh, and for the meats, it can be any kind of meats, red meats, white meats, most vegetables, most fruits and nuts, and some legumes, but near complete, essentially complete avoidance of grains, near complete avoidance of dairy, other than some hard cheeses, and homemade yogurt that has to be fermented for at least 24 hours, as opposed to like the, the two hours that maybe your store-bought yogurt was fermented, um, and sweeteners other than honey. And then again, the Mediterranean diet with lots of olive oil, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and cereals, a little bit of fish and poultry and wine, and, uh, and not really much red or processed meat or sweets was the, the comparator. Um, so we did a 12-week, parallel group randomized clinical trial. So we relied on this randomization. There were 194 people in the study. Um, and we avoided, we excluded people who had like some reasons that the, that the measurements we were gonna do perhaps wouldn't be easy to measure. We made sure everybody was on stable medications and everybody had sort of mild to moderate symptoms. And one of the unique things about this study was we actually provided people with all of their food for the first six weeks because the specific carbohydrate diet is really challenging to follow, much more so than the Mediterranean. Um, and you can see at the bottom, this is an example of a specific, a specific carbohydrate diet dinner. And this is a refrigerator full of prepared foods that all they had to do was just put it in the microwave or the oven, heat it up, and they were ready to go. And if you were on the Mediterranean diet, we did the same thing. So both groups got all their food provided to them for the first six weeks, breakfast, lunch, dinner, two snacks. Um, and we measured the main outcomes at week six. And then for the second six weeks, they were on their own to follow the diets. And then we measured the outcomes again. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you, here's what happened at week six. We looked at 
their symptoms getting better, um, and we saw absolutely no difference. We looked at two different markers of inflammation. Uh, calprotectin is a marker of bowel inflammation, and CRP is a marker of systemic inflammation. Lots of people's calprotectin got better, um, but those wasn't significantly different between the two diets here where, where blue is Mediterranean and orange is specific carbohydrate diet. And very few people who had systemic inflammation at baseline had resolution of that. That was pretty disappointing for us. And again, these are those p-values I was talking about. You can see that none of them are less than 0.05, meaning they weren't significantly different. Of course, it doesn't definitively mean they were equal, but these values are, are quite similar to each other. Um, in contrast, if you look within the groups, again, I told you don't put as much emphasis on this, um, within either of the groups, a number of different measures of, of symptoms or quality of life actually got better. These included um, sort of a quality of life metric that's, that's true to inflammatory bowel disease, pain, sleep, sense of social isolation, fatigue, lots of these things got better with both diets and the magnitude that they got better, again, was not significantly different uh, with, between the two diets. So we felt that both of these diets were well tolerated despite increased consumption of fruits and vegetables. So you can imagine for people with intestinal diseases, we don't always encourage them to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. That symptomatic remission was common with both of the diets, um, but that specific carbohydrate diet was not more effective than the Mediterranean diet for any of these outcomes. Um, and importantly, neither of these was associated with normalization of their systemic inflammation markers. Um, so you could try either of these diets to try and improve your symptoms, but I, I would caution people who want to use this, that they need to really assure that inflammation is resolved, even if their symptoms got better. So I would say this was a study where the glass was half full at the end. Um, I want to tell you about one other diet that's been tested in Crohn's disease and then briefly talk about liver disease. Um, this is called Crohn's disease exclusion diet, um, which is built around the idea that there are things in Western diet that if you take them out, you will change the makeup of the microbes that are living in the intestines. And you might make the intestines less leaky um, and you might reduce inflammation. And mostly this is taking out these things over here, animal fat, wheat, dairy products, red meat, emulsifiers that I told you about before and some other additives, maltodextrin and, and carrageenan, and adding in a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, and so um, this was another randomized parallel group clinical trial where they compared this diet with about 50% of their calories from a formula. So this was that partial enteral nutrition I was telling you about. Um, versus 100% of the calories from the formula, that's exclusive enteral nutrition for six weeks. And then for the second six weeks, they reduced the formula to just 25% here and continued the diet or 25% here and had people sort of go back to their usual diet. And uh, the week six outcomes basically just showed that people preferred to have some food with their formula as opposed to no formula. So they tolerated it better. But more interestingly, at week 12, these children with Crohn's disease, now remember, they're either following the diet or their usual diet for 75% of their calories. The people on the special Crohn's disease exclusion diet were much more likely to be in remission, if you will, from their Crohn's disease um, uh, than the ones who had gone back mostly to their regular diet. And here, they had actually normalization of that CRP marker that I told you about before. So resolution of that systemic inflammation. Um, so that was pretty exciting um, evidence that maybe diet in the whole food setting can really have a therapeutic benefit for people with Crohn's disease. So as we look to the future, I think diet may have a role as primary therapy for mild to moderate uh, inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's disease as long as careful monitoring of the disease activity and nutritional status. And I hope that we'll have more of these evidence-based uh, recommendations 
coming from random, large randomized clinical trials. And maybe we'll be able to leverage things like your genetics, your microbiome, the microorganisms living in you and, and other sort of omics technology to get to what you might think of as either personalized nutrition or to develop medications that actually have the same effect as the food, but lets you eat whatever you want. All right, I'm gonna just wrap up with a, a few comments about nutrition and liver disease. Uh, and I will qualify this by saying it's not where I spend most of my time working, but, uh, but I think it's an interesting topic. Um, I'm gonna talk to you mostly about uh, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. This is used to be known as NAFLD, but now that was non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but the name was recently changed. And this is the most common form of liver disease in the world. About 24% of North Americans have uh, MAFLD. Um, and about a third of them will progress from just having excessive fat in their liver to getting fat with inflammation in their liver. And that has potential consequences to go on to actually cause scarring of the liver and complications of that even going on to cause liver cancer. So you might wonder, how do we treat um, NAFLD or MAFLD? Well, if you, whether you look at the uh, American or the European guidelines, the primary therapy for this is weight loss. Um, the more weight you lose, the better up to about 10% of your body weight. Um, and in terms of diet quality, both of these groups uh, recommend consideration of following, again, this Mediterranean style diet. Um, turns out that fructose, so a component of table sugar and things, high fructose corn syrup, you know, things that make sweetened beverages uh, so sweet, uh, may be a big culprit in causing fat deposition in the liver. And don't worry about the fancy chemistry here. The point is just to, to say that um, there's, a, there's a pathway in which fructose is metabolized that leads to uric acid. It's the small molecule that causes gout that um, triggers this whole, whole cycle to repeat upon itself um, and can cause people to have early uh, components uh, of fat deposition and, de and creation of fat in the liver that, that leads to um, inflammation and or NAFLD um, along the way. And in fact, Again, a randomized clinical trial showed that uh, if you reduced dietary fructose intake, you wound up with less fat in the liver. Um, and again, these are just shown in different ways of um, the amount of fat that was actually being produced in the liver was less in the children on the low fructose diet than on the regular fructose diet. And this held true even if the children didn't lose weight. And that's pretty dramatic, um, suggesting that you know, reducing fructose intake may be beneficial for your liver. Um, and, uh, and here it's looked at a little differently. That last one was showing how much fat was being produced in the liver. This is using MRI to show uh, how much fat actually content there is in the liver. This shows that with a low sugar diet, this is where people started and this is where they ended. They tended to all lose fat, have less fat in their liver, as opposed to those on their usual diet where there really was just no change at all. Um, so where can diet fit into um, management of autoimmune hepatitis? Well, if you're, if you're like the 30% you know, or so of people who also have fatty liver disease, then I think the answer is to start with weight loss and very much consider a low fructose diet. So taking table sugar and high fructose corn syrup out of your diet. Um, and then I think it will, it will behoove the autoimmune hepatitis community to systematically sort of evaluate what are the signals from basic and clinical research that say, well, here's a component of diet that might be important. Uh, you know, maybe it's coffee. There's a lot of science that says that coffee improves people's liver enzymes. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's high fructose corn syrup, as I mentioned before. I'm, I don't know what it is, um, but 
it's going to behoove the organization and the people who are interested in this to really try and look carefully at the literature, try and think about what's driving autoimmune hepatitis, um, and then to develop well-designed studies. So what you don't get at the end of the day is as one of these Cochrane reviews saying, oh, these were all very low quality studies. Um, rather, I think if you're going to go into this, you need to be committed that you're going to do high quality studies to try and get uh, the answer one way or another. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to acknowledge um, many, many, many uh, collaborators who uh, have worked with me on, on some of the things that I've shown you today and some other things. I'm going to acknowledge uh, the all the patients who have participated in the various clinical trials that we've done of diet therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and I'm gonna wrap up there and I'd be happy to try and answer a few questions that you might have. Hey, Dr. Lewis, thank you for a wonderful talk. Just to introduce myself to the whole team here, I'm Craig Lammer, uh, the Executive Director for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association. I'm also a hepatologist at Indiana University. And, we invited Dr. Lewis, and again, what a, what a great talk, and thank you for walking us through that. And, I, and again, kudos for, for making a career and leaning into an area that most of us run from, uh, specifically in diet. And it tends to be the diet question in the hepatology clinic, probably in the IBD clinic too, is as I'm leaving the room, after I've explained autoimmune hepatitis to my best ability over about 40 to 50 minutes, doc, what should I eat? Uh, and this is uh, met with a lot of a lot of grief and a lot of uh, confused looks. As as a physician, I can recommend no significant differences in their diet for them to modify their disease or improve their quality of life. And I think there were some really interesting paradigms. And I think this idea of disease control is important and modification of current immunosuppressive therapy for outcomes, but also the quality of life data. And and in fact, with our organization, we have focus tremendously on quality of life. So some of the data that you, you suggested um, in terms of the, 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 out, or the improvement in quality is really, really interesting. And uh, I can tell you, I've had about, uh, I see a number of AIH patients and I have about a total of five that have made significant dietary changes for the idea they would impact quality of life and specifically of sleep, fatigue or joint pain. Um, and with that, they have all made incremental improvements. So I'm, I've become slowly a believer in diet, which sounds crazy, but uh, I always was worried that people couldn't continue this uh, beyond you know, that initial intervention of a month or two. I know what humans do with diet, but in fact, you know, I, I've seen weight loss with these dietary changes. I've seen the improvement of these symptoms and also led me to conclude, well, is it the obesity and the loss, the, the pro-inflammatory part of the metabolic tissue or is it truly the dietary piece? I think you've convinced me possibly both, but maybe diet is even more important. And just one paradigm to bring up with fatty liver disease and AIH, there's now been three papers. We've done one at our institution that patients with AIH and concurrent fatty liver disease or MAFLD do in fact have worse outcomes. They're harder to treat and they progress in terms of fibrosis at a more accelerated rate. It's not so crazy to think like that. So. I, I do want to put you on the spot just very briefly. I'm going to go back to me leaving the room and I'd say, uh, Dr. Lewis, wait a second. I've been diagnosed with AIH. What is your best hypothesis for what I need to be doing in terms of eating if I want to improve potentially my fatigue, my poor sleep, maybe my mood disorder? What, what is the best highlighting hypothesis that we could come up as an organization or as a patient that has the most data founded from the inflammatory bowel disease literature? Yeah, so I think fatigue and sleep are, are really quite interesting. They're so common to so many of these immune-mated disorders, and I don't think any of us really have a, a great understanding of why that's the case. Um, some of it, I think, is definitely driven by just the inflammatory process, because you get it when you get the flu, you get it when you get COVID. Um, but I, I think there's more to that, and I, I can tell you, in the world of Crohn's disease, there's a significant portion of, proportion of patients who their symptoms, the rest of their symptoms are gone and they still have fatigue. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know where, I don't, in all honesty, so one answer is, so you start asking, can I improve people's sleep? Can I make sure they're not anemic and things like that? Um, but I don't actually know, we don't have a ton of evidence that improving people's sleep actually improves their fatigue unless, Obviously, if they're sleeping four hours a night, 
then why don't you try and get some more sleep? Um, but I actually have a, a theory that when people have fatigue from these systemic diseases, they think that they're sleeping poorly. They may not actually be sleeping poorly, but because they don't feel rested, that intuitively you say, well, I must not have slept well last night. Um, so that so far I've ducked your question of what you should eat, but, but the starting point, um, even though I mentioned coffee before, I, for people who have lots of fatigue, I, you know, if, if there's any sense that they're not sleeping well, I talk to them about, have you ever considered converting from regular coffee or tea to decaf coffee or tea? Um, for those of you who think this is like totally insane, I did this about 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, after a week or two of headaches, it's, it's fine. And I still love a cup of decaf coffee because I like the flavor. Um, but I don't, I don't need the caffeine every morning now. Um, and so the, the reverse of that is there is so much evidence that coffee is associated with better liver enzymes. I don't know if it does anything to the histology. I don't know if it does anything to the long-term course, but I would tell them, if you like coffee, have a couple cups of coffee a day, um, perhaps decaf if you, cause I don't think there's any evidence that it matters whether it's caffeinated or decaffeinated. Um, so I, I would start with that. Um, I would probably push people to say, uh, if, you, if you're willing to, to try a diet composed predominantly of, of fresh ingredients that you're cooking yourself for a while and see if that makes a difference to lean towards this sort of more Mediterranean style diet. Um, and if there was any suggestion that they had fatty liver disease, uh, you know, it's not such a, a reach to say, just take sugar, you don't have to be ultra religious about this, right? Like, but don't be adding extra sugar to things. And if there's high fructose corn syrup in it, just don't consume it. Um, you know, so I'm probably just took ice cream out of your list. I, I, I took sweetened beverages out of your list, but I think those things alone have such potential to potentially improve, uh, a, a number of different health effects um, that I think that's where I would start. And I also, I put this at the very beginning of the talk because this is honestly what I tell people that, look, all things being, being different, all things being the same, we have reasonable therapies to try and control your autoimmune hepatitis. So, so we should, as you said, we should focus on your quality of life and we should focus on you not dying early from heart disease and other things. I don't know the autoimmune hepatitis literature well enough but with NAFLD, the main things people die of is heart disease. If they're not dying so much of cirrhosis, they're dying of heart disease. So we might as well put you on a diet that's gonna reduce your risk of heart disease. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think those are all excellent points. And, and, and I'm gonna make two more points and then I'm gonna shut up. Um, just briefly, I, we just published a paper at Coffee and AIH and we see it was really with disease onset. And so more of an epidemiologic, we see AIH patients drink less it was similar to a paper I wrote as a fellow for PSC and PBC. So we are interested in this, but we didn't see any minimization of progression to fibrosis or transplant. So, but again, absolutely coffee utilization, liver disease as an antifibrotic is probably important. It actually reduced all cause mortality in males and females from an old New England Journal article from about four or five years ago. Beyond that being said, um, coffee as a use for management of fatigue, we, we do employ that in some and has been done in some other autoimmune diseases you probably will know. On, on, on top of that, though, the very last thing, one thing, this Mediterranean versus autoimmune protocol. And again, my, my very limited understanding is there's some changes, some, you know, avoiding nightshade vegetables and, and definitely nuts is also something that's crossed out. Does it matter? I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I think it would be easy enough to say Mediterranean. Um, and again, for shopping lists, I think it makes it easier. Um, any other aspects of this autoimmune protocol? I, I've, I've seen this published among other autoimmune diseases. But again, yeah. it just doesn't, it seems like we're splitting some hairs. What are, you, what are your thoughts? So I think there's only one study of a true autoimmune protocol diet in Crohn's disease, um, but it's very confusing to interpret, even though there's a bunch of papers that came out of that study. I'm on one or two of them, but it's, it's, it's difficult to interpret because these people were all getting also psychological counseling through the process. And I don't know how much of that effect was the psychological counseling versus, versus the diet. I have not been um, a big believer that, you know, you need to avoid nightshades. And I don't actually, I'm, I'm against the idea that you need to avoid nuts. Um, but largely because if you look at the literature on Mediterranean diet, that 
you know, the, the best study that's ever been done of this, there were three arms. The, there was one arm that got supplemented with olive oil and one arm that got supplemented with nuts and one that didn't get supplemented with anything. And it didn't matter whether you got the olive oil or the nuts, you were less likely to have cardiovascular outcomes, particularly stroke. So I think if you need a snack, nuts is a, is a great way to go. Um, and I'm, they're expensive, but um, you know, you're investing in your health. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I'm going to zip it and I'm going to open to others if they would like to ask a question. I know like there's a question in the chat before anybody else talks. It, it says a question about diet. My understanding is to reduce fats for AIH, yet nuts are high in fats. Is this or that a uh, contra contradiction? Yeah, Craig may be better able to answer this than I am, uh, <laughs> but I would say that not all fats are the same. Uh, olive oil is a fat. Um, but it's thought to be a very healthy fat as opposed to, um, you know, eating chicken fat uh, as the extreme on the other side. Uh, and so I think that nuts, again, I said this at the beginning, I, you know, if you got to pick between Doritos and nuts, and that's no strike against Doritos, um, you know, if you're picking between some, some chip or nuts as your snack in the evening, I would encourage you to grab the handful of nuts as opposed to um, one of these other things. If you'd rather have, you know, a piece of fruit, more power to you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And, and maybe just on that note, Dr. Lewis, I, I, I don't think you mentioned much about PUFA or MUFA. Um, any, any words regarding? Yeah, there's some, there's some data more so on, um, on preventing the onset of inflammatory bowel disease more so than effectiveness once you are once you're on disease, it's so hard to, um, in some way, to sort of change our fat ratios of what we're what we're eating. I mean, it's really work. Some of the some of our thoughts in the low red meat diet was that you know we were going to improve the fats that people were consuming. There were some thoughts about um, nitrates that we would be in, improving. Um, you know, again, many of these studies they, they don't all work. That was a glass half full. Um, telling people it's okay to eat red meat you know, other than for your heart uh, and then maybe some other things that that was re rewarding. The flip side is it would have been great if that's all you had to do was cut out red meat. Like that would be such an easy, such an easy intervention. What, one thing that comes up to my mind is this idea of, of artificial sweeteners. Again, a little bit of data in, in the fatty liver disease space as well um, as we take an approach to these other inflammatory conditions, whether it's microbiome or other, some other modification um, what are your, what are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners? I think you touched on it very briefly. Yeah. Um, so my mom told me a long time ago, I shouldn't consume those artificial sweeteners. <laughs> I don't think, I think she probably was right. As you said, there's a little bit of data on maybe them altering the gut microbiome, maybe some influencing your risk of diabetes and things of, of these, yeah. this nature. I don't think they're super well studied at this point. Um, some are more artificial than others, but, um, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, if you can drink water instead of having your artificially sweetened beverage, it's probably a good idea. But um, I, I think we're operating largely in a in a human research void. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And Ad, Adam had put in a question here and asked if there's any good resources. And I think this is a really important question. Good resources for how to avoid some of these things like the emulsifiers, xenobiotics, things like that. Are there, is there any trusted registry or online uh, thing that you share with your patients at all? Yeah, the, Adam, I, I don't have a great tool for that. And I will tell you that they're, um, they're somewhat labeled on, if you, if you read the ingredients on a package, but the quantity are, is not really labeled. So you have no idea whether there's a tiny bit or a lot of bit of different things in there. And I don't want you to leave here today thinking that all all emulsifiers are bad. Some of these probably are not bad for you. I showed you two that at least in animals look like they might be bad. Um, I, but, but I don't, I, I don't want you to leave saying, Oh my God, every additive is horrible for me. Most of these are labeled as generally regarded as safe um, by the FDA. Um, whether that's actually true may or may not be the case, but we don't have a lot of evidence that they're harmful. Um, but the simple way to avoid them is my earlier comment of chop the outside aisle of the grocery store. Those, you know, eggs sitting in their shell still have no additive in them. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're buying chicken that's uncooked, it doesn't have any additives in them. So uh, that's the way, the way to do this. Yeah. 
And then very finally for me, uh, you know, we, we have this as a foundation for a few other talks coming behind you, Dr. Lewis, so with the nutritionist, but also a cook that's a kind of a social media guru. And so for their benefit and kind of my benefit of patients, you know, we talk about fish and, and being, you know, heavy in some of these, these fish. Mercury always comes up with patients and again, within this realm as well. But what is our favorite fish? What do we like to look at? And in terms of how many times can we eat that a week? Uh, yeah, so in the US, the number one seafood that is consumed is shrimp. Uh, interestingly enough, um, <laughs> salmon and tilapia are sort of in the kind of like runner up land, but they're, they're a way back distant second and third, I think behind shrimp. And there may be some others that, that are up there, but shrimp is way ahead of everything else. Um, uh, and tuna from the can is probably pretty high up on the list as well. I, I, what I would say is, you know, if you can pick an oily fish, that's probably the right answer. So in the U.S., salmon is probably the econ um, or steelhead or probably the most economic of them. Um, somebody is eventually um, going to type in uh, something that says, well, do I need to get, um, you know, farm raised versus non farm raised uh, salmon? I, if you can get non farm raised, all the better. But if all you can get are farm raised, that's that's probably reasonable. And everything in life in moderation. Um, you know, I don't think you should be having, I have, a, you know, so I know someone who was eating sushi literally like five or six days a week. I was like, I think that's probably not a good idea. Um, the flip side is I think it's totally reasonable to, to try and work some fish into your diet several days a week if you can. Fair enough. And, and I, I think just to dovetail that, Pam had a question, any recommendations for supplements? And I'm going to try to interpret that. I'm assuming thinking about things like omega-3, vitamin D, other, other micro yeah. molecules that you would recommend. I, I think the supplement that um, that sort of raises the most interest is curcumin. Um, it, none of the studies are really great, um, but it's intriguing because it seems like it maybe really is biologically active. Um, and so, you know, if I was going to go after a supplement to study, I think maybe it, it would be uh, curcumin. Um, obviously being sort of careful in sort of what, who your supplier was and, and what you were, what you were actually studying. Um, in, in Crohn's disease, the omega-3 fatty acids um, had two really well done, very large studies that were profoundly negative, but actually resulted in the product being marketed for reducing triglycerides. Um, like, cause it, it showed this clear, enormous effect on triglycerides. <laughs> Um, and so maybe that would be valuable in, in the, in the sort of overlap of fatty liver disease, um, with autoimmune hepatitis to think sure. about. And, and, and speaking to that then too, one thing that is shared with IBD and AIH is this, uh, low vitamin D, at least from my understanding of the IBD literature, low vitamin D has been linked with worse outcomes, at least surgical and, and others in IBD, similar to AIH actually in two papers, not well done studies, but it's of interest because prior candidate gene studies have looked at vitamin D receptor and AIH as a, as a risk factor, at mm -hmm. least some SNPs or alleles. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I tend to check vitamin D and, and replete when it's not. Um, any utility, by the way, I'll, I'll frame this in vitamin D and COVID. So there's another reason that maybe we, we lean on vitamin D a little bit more from some of the experience that's been seen. Again, not, not terribly strong, but some signals. Um, vitamin D supplementation, useful, keeping it above a certain level. Yeah, so we routinely check in people with more with Crohn's disease than ulcerative colitis, but more so, even though there is a little bit of evidence that maybe it had some therapeutic benefit, I, I do it mostly because our population is at increased risk for, um, for osteoporosis. And so um, I, uh, I do it to try and minimize that risk. Thank you again. And thanks for spending the hour with us. We appreciate it and really invaluable. And uh, thanks for everybody for joining us. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.